Are you a Canadian living in the U.S.? We're talking today about how to get the most from both your U.S. and Canada retirement accounts. Welcome to Retirement Revealed. I'm your host, Jeremy Kyle, and we're here to turn your retirement savings into retirement income. Today, we're talking with Joe Curry about how to get the most from both your U.S. and Canada retirement accounts. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeremy. Happy to be here. Yeah, and uh, if you didn't pick up on it already, uh, Joe is from Canada. I'm from the U.S. Joe, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. So, uh, Jeremy, just like you, you know, I have a similar practice uh, up here in Canada. So, Peterborough, Ontario, just outside Toronto. Um, work with a lot of retirees and near retirees, trying to help them kind of make that transition from working into retirement and from saving into creating retirement income, you know, without paying too much tax and all a while you know, making sure that we're making the best of our retirement, having purpose, living to our values, all that kind of stuff. That's great. Uh, and I don't know what it is about uh, Canada or Canadian retirees, but we do a lot of podcasts and blogs about uh, retirement coaching, kind of the non-financial side of retirement. It seems like most of the best uh, retirement coaches out there either live in Canada or have some uh, Canadian connection. I don't know. Tell, tell me what what do you have figured out in Canada that we need some help on in here in the U.S.? I don't know. It's interesting because I feel like uh, we've actually had a few of them on uh, on our show as well. But uh, I feel like when we're looking at the financial planning side of things, in a lot of ways, we're behind, I feel like, from where you guys are. So I don't know. I guess maybe the people with those minds of going a little more holistic are on the coaching side rather than the, the planning side. But one way or another, some people are figuring that side out. I guess uh, the grass is greener on both sides, I, I suppose. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm curious. You're, I think you're younger than me, uh, but I'm curious. How, how do you envision spending your retirement? What's your thought of you? You spend all this time planning for retirement. What's you, what's your thought? How it's going to look for you? That's a great question. Um, for me, I think it's in some shape or form still doing some kind of business. Uh, I mean, I love what I do. I love seeing our clients, but I also love you know running our business. Um, so I feel like as long as I'm mentally able to to do that, I'm going to be there. But probably just going to be a lot less. So maybe um, a little more time traveling with my wife and uh, hopefully my kids still want to hang out with me then, that kind of stuff. But I think I'll I'll stay involved in this because I love the the growth, the learning and, you know, continuing to, to ad adapt. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And uh, like I said, we have both have similar focuses. We help people make great retirement decisions. Of course, you're in Canada. I'm in the U.S. Uh, but we're talking today how to help Canadians retire in the U.S. And I just went through. I've got a bunch of questions to ask you. So I'm just going to dive in and let's just uh, figure this out. Hopefully get some good education out there to the Canadians uh, that are retiring in the U.S. Let's uh, do so it. My first question, can you have investment accounts in both the U.S. and Canada? Yeah, so great question. Um, it's a little bit of a multifaceted question, actually, because you can have uh, quite... You can have accounts in both the U.S. and Canada, but in can if you're living in the U.S. in Canada, you can only have certain types of accounts. So what you can have is what we would call a non-registered account. So that's um, so for you guys, I mean, it's a, a non-retirement, non-Roth account type uh, type of situation. So those accounts, an advisor, like no one can actually look after those um, without being licensed in, in the U.S. So there has to be basically a firm who is not only in the U.S but that U.S. firm is also has some kind of like a division in Canada. That's really the only way to manage those assets. Um, so otherwise in Canada, what you can hold on to and what you basically have to hold on to, unless you want to pay a bunch of tax is your retirement account. So for us, that's your RRSPs, registered retirement savings plans. Um, if it was pension money, that's so money that's coming out of a defined benefit pension, that would be in what we call a lira, a locked in retirement account. Um, so those are basically the only accounts you're going to leave in Canada. If you are a Canadian citizen who goes to the U.S. to work. Well, I've got to ask you then, what's a lock-in retirement account? Yeah, so a lot of times, and I'm not sure, you know, the nuances or the differences between a defined benefit pension in Canada and the U.S., but in Canada, there's a commuted value there. And in certain scenarios, you can take that commuted value. So one of those is if you're terminated or you leave your job and you're not at retirement age yet. And so in Canada, the government has more or less said that that pension is earmarked for retirement. So there's some restrictions on how you access it and you can't access it until after the age of 55. And then uh, kind of like an RMD, there's some regulations around how you access that money. So there's a minimum, but there's also a maximum. And that's again, just to make those, those pensions last longer and be there to support people through retirement, which was the initial purpose. Yeah, it's kind of showing how similar things are uh, in North America, but also how different because there are 
you know, pensions in the U S that have somewhat similar rules They're almost like a cash balance plan in a way. So it's like you, you earn money, but it's really for your retirement. And so it's kind of interesting how there's some, some, um, kind of crossover there and that, that term lock in retirement account, I had not heard that one. So thanks for explaining that for me. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> but you, you mentioned, uh, both non-retirement accounts. It's tough. Uh, it's tough to name what a non-retirement account is. Like there's no, there's names like IRAs and Roth and, and RRSP for Canada, but like, what do you call just a regular account? I don't know. But I, 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 I think non-retirement is about the best term I can come up with because there's no official name. Uh, but you mentioned that non-retirement accounts and kind of the rules there are different than retirement accounts. Uh, so what are the options that you have for your Canada retirement accounts when you live in the U.S.? Sure. So one of the things I always tell people is uh, if you haven't left and you know you're going to the U.S. to work and live, then you'll want to make sure you have a good relationship with your advisor before you go. Because once you go, you can't change advisors, which seems a little bit unfair. It's your money. You should be able to do whatever you want with it. But the problem is from a regulation standpoint in Canada is that we're unable to solicit or take on any business from someone who is not a resident in Canada. What we're able to do is, uh, and I always use the example, my brother-in-law is, you know, we have his retirement accounts and he's okay with me saying that, but uh, he was my client before he left, right? So uh, we continue to maintain that portion of his, his portfolio, but everything else he has is now in the U.S. with an advisor in the U.S., um, if he didn't want me to look after it anymore, he cannot take it to another advisor because, because again, no one's able to take it on. So basically the only option you have is to, to move it to a self-directed account. And we've called around and looked into different options. And the only one that we can, we can find is actually quest trade is they will take on those accounts. And again, in a self-directed manner. So, uh, you have to go through a special process with them. You can't do their online application. Um, but they'll get you set up. You can move that in. Once it's in there, then it's fully on you to make all the investment decisions. Like there's no guidance advice. Um, so you need to be comfortable to make those decisions if you're going to make that move. Yeah. Sounds like uh, with a lot of things financial, you want to plan for things ahead of time. Uh, like don't don't call your advisor after you move to the U.S. and say, hey, I need some help here or, or you know, or I got to make some changes. Uh, it, it seems like you got to plan that ahead of time. Yeah. And I mean, hopefully if you have a good relationship with your advisor before you move, that might be something you should be talking about, you know, well in advance uh, as part of your fi financial planning. Yeah, for sure. Now, uh, just like you move to the U S uh, your, you know, your, your house yourself, uh, you might want to move some investment accounts. So which investment accounts should transfer to the U S and what should stay in Canada? Yeah. So those retirement accounts we just talked about, um, even if you wanted to move that money, you're not going to want to, because you're going to have, um, some pretty large withholding tax on there. Um, and it's all going to go to your taxable income. So I'm sure that's similar to, to the U S. Um, but those non-registered accounts, because you can't do anything with them here in Canada anyway. So that's the money that, uh, they're not locked up in any way. There's no withholding tax to move it out. Uh, if those investments are on exchanges, you're probably able to transfer them right into, uh, those non-retirement accounts, I guess, as we'll call them in the U S. So that's the kind of stuff that, that you want to move. Um, you know, a lot of people have, um, you know, rental properties, real estate. I mean, you can hold on to that in Canada. Again, you you're not really going to be having anyone manage that maybe some, from a property management standpoint, but um, any kind of financial decisions around that, you're going to be making it, but you can, you can still hold that property there if you've had it. Um, but a lot of cases we see people just sell it when they move and they take that money with them and invest it in the States anyway. Okay. Yeah. So then it, it seems like kind of your, your non-retirement accounts are probably better off going kind of following along with you to the U S but with the rules uh, and, and perhaps penalties, you're better off keeping the, retirement accounts that are from Canada in Canada. So that lets me, see, lets me think, okay, how does it work to take distributions from your Canadian retirement accounts when you live in the U S? Sure. So you can, um, I mean, you can get the distributions similar to, I'm sure you would any retirement accounts in the U S uh, what happens is there is the withholding tax. There is minimum. So once you're 71, you have to move from an RRSP into a RIF, which is a registered retirement income fund. All the rules are the same. The only difference is the RIF is for distributions. The RSP is for savings, right? So that has to flip over at age uh, 71. And then what you guys would refer to as the RMD, that kicks in at age 72. And then a minimum has to come out. But you can do it before that. You can switch to a RIF at any time and you can take withdrawals from an RRSP if you want but there's going to be that withholding tax there. So there is tax treaty between Canada and the U S and you don't have 
to pay that kind of double taxation. Uh, but if you do nothing, you will have that double taxation, right? So essentially what you need to do is I always recommend work with an accountant who has some experience in cross-border taxes. And through uh, a process, you could apply to get that withholding tax from the Canadian retirement accounts back. Uh, and then everything will work out the way that it's supposed to. But again, it, it's an extra step on on your part because you need to go through that process and apply for it. It doesn't just automatically happen. Yeah, I suppose uh, the, the Canada-US tax treaty is uh, probably a whole bunch of rules and they want to make sure that you follow the rules. Uh, on there, but it, there's kind of a theory. And I, I see this on, uh, on U S income taxes, where if you had paid for in taxes, uh, you know, on your investments, you might, you might have an international account. And I see that there's almost these, uh, helps and deductions or credits that are on your U S taxes. The, the theory is that things shouldn't be taxed twice. Uh, but you got to follow the rules, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a little easier for, a Canadian going to the U.S. because most of the world bases their tax system on your uh, residency, whereas the U.S. is based on the citizenship, right? So when you come to Canada, if you're from the U.S., um, there's still some restrictions around like filing your taxes in the U.S. and in Canada. Right on. Yeah, you're 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 right on about that. Well, can uh, can you still get the Canada pension plan if you live in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, you can. So the Canada Pension Plan is uh, something that you contribute to when you're working in Canada. So it comes right off of your your paycheck. Um, if you're employed by someone else, it's going to be contributed to by your contributions and also your employers. And it's going to be paid based on when you take it and how much you contributed and what your average earnings were. Right. So it will still pay out because you contributed to it. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're living in Canada or if you're living elsewhere. Yeah. Speaking of living, I was doing some research and there's another piece of it called old age security. Uh, what's the difference between the Canada pension plan and old age security? Sure. So the Canada pension plan, as I mentioned, is something you contribute to. So it's a, a pension you're paying into, your employer's paying into it. But old age security is more of a, a benefit. It's a government benefit that you never contribute to. It's just something you receive based on how long you've lived in Canada. So where one is more of a pension, one's more of a benefit just for being a Canadian resident. Yeah, it sounds a little bit uh, like Social Security. I imagine it's pretty similar. So I'm I'm curious if you know, can you get both old age security from Canada and Social Security from the U.S.? Um, so the base, the way that the old age security will work. So let's just say you're living in the U.S. You're not in Canada. Is you can't necessarily collect that based on. It just depends on how long you lived and worked in Canada. So if you worked for at least twenty years. And so lived in and worked in Canada for at least 20 years after the age of 18, then you can receive that old age security, even if you're not living in Canada. But if it's less than 20 years and you're living outside of Canada, you won't actually receive any of the old age security. But on the social security side, I'm not sure kind of what the uh, kind of the crossover overlap benefit might be from uh, from your standpoint. I just kind of know that the old, old age security will pay out on the Canada side. Yeah. And so to answer that, the answer is yes, you can get the social security, even if you are uh, receiving a pension from anywhere, we're talking Canada. Uh, the difference is they have something called the windfall elimination provision, which basically says uh, if you worked and paid into social security less than 30 years uh, in the US, then they, they kind of withhold a bit from the social security. So I'll put a link into that uh, WEP, the windfall elimination provision. Uh, directly to the, there's calculators that social security has uh, on there. Uh, I imagine that's not too bad of a place. Let's see, let's figure this out. You start working at 18, you move to the U S around age 40, and then you work for about 30 years in the U S and you get, you get the best of both worlds. That seems like the answer. <laughs> well, it, it sounds good, but you're still going to get a reduced benefit if you didn't live here kind of the whole 40 years. And also it's not the biggest benefit. It's like, so the max right now is uh, around $650 a month. If you've maxed it out and that's, remember, that's Canadian dollars too. So you're not winning the lottery. There you go. <laughs> well then, uh, I, I suppose that's the reason why they have the Canada pension plan too, where you're adding money into it. How, how can you get the most money out of that Canada pension plan? Yeah. So you, you contribute uh, a percentage up to the yearly maximum pensionable, pensionable earnings for the YMPE. And so basically that right now, I believe is around $67,000. So if you're making over that number, over $67,000, you're making those max contributions. And then the normal retirement age is age 65. So basically they'll let you throw out kind of the, your eight lowest earning years. So if you had some years you didn't work 
or we're just lower earning. So they'll throw those eight out and they take the average pensionable earnings over the remaining years to then calculate your benefit and you get the full benefit uh, up to what you're eligible for at age 65. Now you could take it earlier, but you take, you pay a penalty uh, 0.6% per month early uh, and you can take it as early as age 60. And the flip side of that is you could wait up until uh, age 70 and you get a, a benefit for delaying, right? So for a lot of people, if they've kind of max funded it, they've worked past age 60 uh, and they have large retirement accounts, we might look at actually uh, trying to push off and delay so we can get that higher guaranteed income. And also we can get some money in those retirement accounts and lower tax brackets. But delaying is assuming you've contributed for most of those working years is the is the way to max it out. Yeah, you said 0.6% per month, which uh, quick math says about 7% per year seems somewhat similar almost to the way Social Security works in the US, where really, uh, if you're trying to max out what you get out of the Canada pension plan or out of Social Security, uh, oftentimes the the way to get the highest benefit is just to, to wait. Um, I guess, fortunately, in both cases, 70 is the, the max uh, for you there. But then everyone says, well, is it even worth it to wait? And that's why I encourage people to go to longevityillustrator.org, which just says, uh, here is a uh, good estimate of your life expectancy. Uh, I, I think they're based on U.S. numbers, but I got a feeling maybe uh, Canada and U.S. have somewhat similar uh, life expectancy in numbers. Yeah, I think I think that we might actually be just slightly longer than you guys. Yep, the air, would, might, air might be a little fresher up here. I don't know. <laughs> that's probably what it is. Uh, it's the uh, fresh maple syrup instead of the uh, what the corn syrup or the uh, you know you got to yeah. get the, uh, the yeah. The, there you go. <laughs> the better, more natural foods in you, right? Exactly. <laughs> Well, if you, so let's see, if you're a Canadian and you're living in the U.S., do you need to file tax returns in both Canada and the U.S.? If you're a Canadian living in the U.S., you don't need to file tax returns here. Um, again, because it's residency based as far as Canada is concerned. So if you're not living here, you don't actually have to file it here. Now, I think there might be a couple um, uh, potential circumstances that that's not always true for, like if you had some kind of income here still. So um, like if you still had some kind of business to real estate income. Um, but for the most part, yeah, if you're living and working in the U.S., you're just filing your U.S. tax return. Yeah, I suppose though, if you're taking the distributions from the retirement accounts and you want to avoid that double taxation, you want to at least have an accountant that knows kind of that cross-border, that Canada-U.S. tax treaty to Figure yeah, out. so there's going to be a component to that. And to be honest, off the top of my head, I can't say for sure if you have to actually file a tax return here, but I know you need to file, again, that kind of that form to make sure you're not paying that double taxation. Yeah, make sure it makes sense. Good. Well, I'm uh, curious then, uh, you mentioned RRSP. Uh, can you have both that RRSP in Canada and the IRA in the US? Yeah, and I think that most people do because uh, as long as you're working and living in Canada, you're able to contribute to that RRSP. When you leave and go to the U.S. and start working, nothing happens to that RRSP. Like we said, you're kind of stuck unless you want to pay all that withholding tax. But once you're down there working, uh, you're going to then contribute under the same rules that anyone else in the U.S. is contributing under at that point. Yeah, right on. Well, I've asked you a ton about how can uh, Canadians can retire in the U.S. What what have I not asked you that I, that I should have perhaps? Uh uh, like I said before the show, when we were talking about the questions, I mean, you came with a lot of questions. I don't even know if I would have come come up with, but uh, I, I think we've done pretty good to hit the highlights here. Again, if you're if you know you're leaving from whether whichever way you're going from one country to the other, I mean, hopefully you're working with a planner. That's something you want to bring up ahead of time so you can be making any decisions that need to be made before you leave, rather than looking back and finding out like you can't move accounts and different things like this, right? So I'd just say, yeah. Um, yeah, plan ahead. But as far as other questions to ask, I, I think you nailed most of them. Yeah, well, I, like you said, I did my research because I knew I was uh, bringing you on and wanted to get uh, get some great advice and some great education out there to you. Well, then if uh, if we're we're done with the questions, I've just got one more for you, Joe. But before that, tell us what's the best way for people to reach out to you. Sure. So, uh, retirementplanningsimplified.ca is uh, it's kind of our education website. We have a lot of Canadian retirement education stuff, and uh, you'll also find. Um, uh, a link to if you want to book a call with me or reach out to me, but info at Matthews and associates.ca is the best way to reach me by email. And you can find me on LinkedIn. If you just look up my name, Joseph Curry. Perfect. We'll put links into all the ads. And of course, if you'd like more ideas on how to make your retirement great, just go ahead right now, click that subscribe button. 
All right, Joe, final question. Tell us something about yourself that few people know about. And remember, this podcast is rated clean. <laughs> well, if it's clean, um, uh, not many people know that I had a very short, I mean, very short scene in uh, The Love Guru with Mike Myers, uh, a hockey player at the, uh, I guess there was a bit of a highlight scene at the very start of the movie. So uh, you don't see my face or anything, but I, I make it through the screen. That's awesome. You said you were one of the hockey players in that? Yeah. All right. I've got uh associate who's big into hockey from North Dakota. Uh, so I, I gotta, I gotta go find that and have him uh, critique. Let me know if you're any good at all. <laughs> <laughs> good luck finding me. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's fun. Awesome. Well, thanks Joe for coming on, uh, teaching us all about how to get the most out of your, your Canada and U S retirement to, when, when that applies to, 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 to everyone there. I appreciate you having me, Jeremy. It's been fun chatting. You got it. And uh, thank you for listening to the Retirement Reveal podcast. We believe if you know more about your money, you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions.